right. <clears throat> Great. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much um, for joining us this morning. Uh, this is a very special month. And, um, you know, this is the month in which we recognize and um, honor women around the world, not just um, in one geographic area, but around the world. Women's History Month is celebrated globally. And of course, there is that one special day we celebrate Women's International or International Women's Month or International, excuse me, International Women's Day. But uh, for the entire month of March, um, we recognize women in various spaces, whether it's entrepreneurship and small business development, whether it's STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, education, in law, you name it. We recognize women um, in, in various spaces for all of the uh, contributions that they're making to our society. And um, we know that uh, unfortunately, there's still uh, a lot of ground to be made with recognizing women for what they do, women who are empowered uh, to do phenomenal things in, in these various spaces. And, um, you know, equality, women's equality is still something that, you know, we have to bring up to par. But I am so happy to be here this morning uh, hosting this panel with these five, five amazing ladies from five different countries. And um, we're going to hear their stories and we're going to, you know, um, you know, just, just have the opportunity to learn a lot about um, women entrepreneurship in various countries. My name is Austin Thompson with Thompson Management Consulting. And as you know, I have been hosting, uh, actually organizing and planning the Entrepreneurship and Small Business Summit for the past nine years. We are in the ninth year of the Entrepreneurship and Small Business Summit. And um, I, am, I am happy to, to still, uh, continue this endeavor, this initiative, which is a signature program from Thompson Management Consulting. Uh, unfortunately, over the past two years, we've had to be on virtual platform uh, due to COVID-19. However, um, we still continue uh, to, uh, you know, to do what we can to provide programs and initiatives uh, for small business owners. We know small businesses run the world, uh, entrepreneurs run the world. Without our, our innovative entrepreneurs, our invigorated entrepreneurs who take the risks to start businesses and, and to help create jobs, um, you know, we would not have successful economies. So, you know, we're glad to, to be doing this nine years on. Um, and, you know, hopefully next year we'll get back to face-to-face, -face, um, you know, programs and, and having the Entrepreneurship and Small Business Summit return to a conference center where everyone can gather in one space and, um, and enjoy uh, the, the networking and the educational part of it. Um, what I would like to do now is just, um, <clears throat> you know, just to uh, do a little housekeeping. I like for all my attendees who are joining us virtually to, you know, to, to turn on your cameras and show your face. It's always great to know who's part of, uh, of the audience, not just our speakers, but we want to see your beautiful faces. You know, and we, we, we want to, you know, we want to be really engaging. So I, you know, don't feel bashful or, you know, shy. Just, you know, turn on those cameras and let's see who you are and um, come on in and, and join the discussion. Um, you know, we'd like to ask everyone to please keep your mics muted. Um, we're, our, our panelists will be speaking and answering questions. And um, at the end, when we have the Q&A, will ask you to just turn on your mic, ask a question, and then turn it back off. So this way we can keep down any feedback or any noise in the background and, um, and not cause any distractions, all right? And finally, you know, um, as this is an opportunity to network, this is an opportunity to build relationships, right? This is why we do this. Please, you know, put your names and your contact information in the chat. Uh, put questions in the chat because we want you to ask your questions. And, um, and this way, you know, you can follow up with our panelists. You can follow up with one another. Collaboration, you know, this, this, is, um, this is one of the ways in which we grow successfully as entrepreneurs and as small business owners. Collaborations, partnerships, 
You know, there's there there are things that you know others know that you might not be familiar with, and it's and it's a good way to build that acumen when you can build relationships and learn a lot about what somebody else is doing, right? And um, be able to find ways to collaborate. So with that, um, I would like to move into uh, today's program. Um, you know, we're we're celebrating uh, women's entrepreneur, excuse me, uh, Women's History Month, Women's Excellence and Entrepreneurship. This is a glo uh, a global perspective uh, from five women representing their respective countries. Okay, and then late, uh, just a, a little bit midway, um, I, we will have um, Elaine Amankwa uh, Nietman uh, from Ghana, and and um, you know, she will, um, I invited her to just give some, give a perspective on, on what's happening with women in Ghana, you know, so um, we'd definitely love to have her input as well. But right now, I'd like to go to our panelists and for an introduction. I, I don't like to read bios. This is my style. I like for the speakers themselves to, to, to take about a, you know, about a minute or two to you know, just to tell us a little bit about who they are, what they do, what country they represent. And this way, you know, they can they can put their own flavor to it, all right? So I would like to start with um, our very own Maxine Barnett um, and we'll have her introduce herself. Good morning, everyone. Just checking in to make sure you can hear me. Yes, ma'am. And Yes, and also the noise that I talked about at the beginning, it seemed to have stopped. So once I'm convinced it has stopped, I'm going to do this. Yes? Yes, ma'am. Hear me now that I've removed it. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. So I am delighted to be part of this panel, this panel of, of very, very illustrious women. I'm humbled to share the platform with them. And I'm hoping that at the end of this, that we can continue to our conversations off air and be able to link up and so on. I am from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, but I'm talking with you from the US. I'm in the US right now. I've been here actually during the entire um, pandemic. And um, uh, while the virtual space um, uh, presents a barrier in a sense where we can't meet in person, um, the virtual space has taken me all over the world. So um, I, am, I am someone who actually enjoy the virtual space as, as well as it lasted. Uh, I am an executive coach, but prior to that, I'm an executive coach who moved from an HR executive and organizational development consultant into coaching. And it was um, as, as, an, as an executive, as a corporate executive, I saw and noticed that brilliant, brilliant and technically competent persons, they could not, they didn't, they lacked the skills. While they were brilliant in their, in their sphere, they lacked the skills to navigate the workspace as they climb the corporate ladder. So I noticed that. So sometimes they sabotage them, themselves as leaders. So I took it upon myself to start looking at that, researching that, studying that. We didn't call it soft skills at that time. We called it civility and business etiquette and those soft things that were needed to, you know, to, to polish leaders and so on. So as I trained myself in that, I started offering those kinds of training programs within the organizations that I was in. And then there were persons in other organizations who would invite me to do the same with their board or do the same with their executive team and so on. And that's what planted the seed to start to get out there and actually offer these services to a wider cross section of persons. So that is my short story in a nutshell as to how I became uh, from an executive to a consultant to an executive coach uh, at Soft Skill Services, which is my organization. Uh, we, offer, we offer the kinds of, of um, tools to help leaders to maximize, amplify, or hone their soft skills that are needed to achieve leadership and business success. And when I say that we do this with leaders, it's leaders at all levels, whether you're in the executive suite, whether you're someone who's looking to lead a team, whether you're a business owner. And where I see that I'm doing more business recently is employees who are jumping off to become entrepreneurs. So I feel that I'm in good company because people here are entrepreneurs. So that's my story in a nutshell. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Maxine. Uh, Ms. Maxine and I met when I was um, a panelist on uh, a panel that she moderated uh, discussing 
um, what was it? Uh, it was um, you were talking about business to business between the Caribbean and the and the United States, right? And foreign yeah. direct yeah. investment, right? Yeah. Uh, specifically, yeah. so we've been friends so far. So thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning, Miss Samuel Forna King, representing Freetown Sierra Leone. How are you? Hello everyone. You know, this virtual space, you need to know when to mute and unmute. <laughs> good afternoon again, everyone. Actually, it's good morning, maybe in some parts of the world. Um, I am Sama Ramatu Fauna King. I represent the country of Sierra Leone. If you don't know where Sierra Leone is, it is in West Africa. We are known for our diamonds and we're very rich in um, natural resources. I um, fortunately um, have had the exposure of living in the United States um, where I lived in Atlanta, Georgia for 30 years. I actually lived in Atlanta for 30 years, had my children and, um, and you know, I've left a lot of family and friends there. But um, while in Atlanta, I was in the corporate space. I worked for Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies, um, Kimberly Clark Corporation, Nextel, Sprint, First Data Corporation. And in all of those um, um, companies, I was high in the sales um, spectrum there. Um, but seven years ago, my life kind of changed and I found myself here in Sierra Leone. Um, but, you know, go back 10 years as I visited, because I always visited, and um, I saw a space, I saw a niche, I saw something that needed to be done here in Sierra Leone. And that was in the space of soft skills training, which um, there was really nothing, very, or very limited um, training in that space. So 10 years ago, I actually created my company and um, I went back and forth um, doing trainings. But then in 2015, um, the Lord finally brought me here in Sierra Leone. And I have been working with um, corporations here, helping them with um, training of their staff. Um, and I'll tell you some more how I actually came to Sierra Leone when we're done with the introductions. But I'm actually very happy to be here today. I'm happy to be in the same room with like-minded women. And thank you again, Austin. Give me Austin. Okay, I muted myself to, you know, minimize feedback and then I didn't unmute to speak. I'm mute. Yeah. <laughs> so Sam and, Sam and I met about 20 <laughs> years ago at a workshop at Georgia State University and we have connected and been friends ever since. I got, I was kind of sad when I found out she was moving back to Sierra Leone, but I'm happy for what she's doing there in Sierra Leone and, and running our own business and creating jobs and it's phenomenal. Thank you, Simon, for joining um, Ms. Jill Goodrich, good morning. Good morning, Austin. How are you doing? Excellent, excellent. Well, thank, thank you, you so much for having me today. Thank you. Welcome. So um, my name is Jill Goodrich. I'm the founder, president, and CEO of the Women's Chamber of Commerce. Um, we are located here in the metro Atlanta area. <laughs> Um, but we do have uh, opportunities and we are speaking with um, some various cities uh, to expand and to launch new chapters. So if you or someone you know is interested, please let me know. Um, I actually lived, uh, I grew up in Michigan um, here in the U.S. and moved to Atlanta for opportunities in the late 90s. Um, and I guess it was around 2008 uh, that an opportunity came up to move to the Netherlands. So I lived in Amsterdam for five years. Um, I have dual citizenship and actually launched uh, a women's group while I was there. I find that being forced outside of your comfort zone is how you grow. If you stay inside of your bubble, you're, you're not going to experience the same level of growth. So 
as Austin had mentioned, uh, I also consider myself a little bit of an introvert, uh, but I was forced outside of my comfort zone. I had to make new friends. I had to learn a new language. And uh, as a result, I, I launched a women's group in Amsterdam. And by the time I left to return to Atlanta, uh, there were over 5,000 women in the group. And I decided I needed to replicate and do something like that here in the US and was hoping to bridge the, the groups together and uh, possibly uh, do trade, um, all kinds of opportunities to network and learn from each other. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been quite a journey. And uh, I think it was two, this is actually the fifth year. Um, it was 2017 um, when I launched the Women's Chamber here. And uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I'm trying to speak as quickly as possible. Yeah, you can wrap up and we'll get to the next person. Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, we'll just leave it there and happy to answer any questions uh, later in the program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Jill. Jill and I actually haven't physically met. <laughs> we, I was introduced to Jill through... Um, a young lady I met at a, at a networking event and she spoke so highly of Jill Goodrich. And I'm like, I got to meet this Jill Goodrich, you know, and we've, we've actually set up several times to meet, but our schedules just couldn't link. So um, Jill invited me on to her Women's History Month uh, uh, workshops last year. I was so impressed with what she did and all of the women from various countries that were on. And, and I said, you know, one day we're going, to, we're going to meet and I hope soon. So thank you, Jill. Um, for coming on. I actually attended your second summit in person, uh, and I did introduce myself to you, but I'm sure you meet many people, and uh, but we will meet again soon, I hope. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Dr. Gamachida Matizo, representing South Africa. Good morning. Well, a very good evening to everyone. And good evening. 18 minutes past five from this side of the world. Quite a chilly start to a Thursday. Lots of rain this side, but everything is all right. And lovely to see and a lot of beautiful faces. Sometimes you forget that there are many phenomenal women across the world equally doing great work. So it's really delightful to be here. So thank you so much, Austin. My yeah. name is Gamuchirai Motezo. The short version is Gamu. Because some people look at my name and they start wondering how on earth do we begin to enunciate? I'm originally from Zimbabwe, but butted in South Africa. And the area of interest is threefold in looking at African cities and urban planning, secondly, organic waste management, as well as renewable energy, and lastly, entrepreneurship development. So I work as the Chief Operations Officer at 22 on Slow, which is Africa's largest startup campus, where we do eat, sleep, talk, breathe, all things along the value chain of entrepreneurship. Because the reality is not all of us can be saturated into the employment space. Why not inculcate that gospel of entrepreneurship? And secondly, I also run a company called Madam Waste, where I specialize in urban and energy planning. So the two components I mentioned around African cities and urban development, as well as organic waste and renewable energy, culminate into this consulting company, as well as future technology developer. Lastly, you might notice I enjoy talking. I'm an MC facilitator and host a whole variety of workshops, all centered around knowledge sharing as well as developmental concepts. And everything that I do is underpinned by the concept of Afrocentricity, very much inculcated in what this continent has to offer. That's me in a nut of a nut of a nutshell. Thank you, Austin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, when I first met, um... Dr. Matizo, it was at uh, the Global Entrepreneurship Conference in Johannesburg, South Africa. And um, we've been linked ever since as, as good friends and often share conversations, just sharing great stories on entrepreneurship and sometimes a little bit of politics and, and, um, and other things, but I really enjoyed your friendship. And congratulations to Dr. Matizo, newly minted doctor, PhD, 
in environment is it uh, environmental engineering am i do i have it right i'll give you a distinction 80 out of 100 <laughs> chemical <laughs> engineers <laughs> specializing in organic waste management and anaerobic digestion technology Right, great. Thank you so much. And congratulations. And she, and she was doing all that while working on her PhD. So phenomenal, phenomenal. Thank you. <laughs> Karen Okuvuru, representing Kampala, Uganda. Last but certainly not least. <laughs> Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Uh, Karen Okuvuru is my name. Um, yeah, um, I work. I'm from Uganda. I'm a bit nervous. I'm going to be shaky, but yeah, that's okay. I work for marketing and communication company. So I, I should be the best communicator here, I guess. But yeah, I'll, I'll get it. Um, I, I've been running the brand factory for about five years uh, with a group of young creatives who are eager, you know, as women. So first of all, just a little bit. Um, I, my name Okuvuru, Oku means women. So in my, in my language, it means women. Like, so my dad had so many girls and then I also came along and he's like, whoa, another woman. So I'm from a, a, a family of many women. I like employing lots of uh, women. I work very closely with lots of women and we're a group of young creatives, you know, just um, expressing ourselves. But we express ourselves through marketing and um, creativity, through you know communicating, helping brands. We help build brands. You know, when companies are just starting up, you're a passionate entrepreneur. But you know, you want how do people perceive me, and how do people get me? So I usually call it the baptism of your company. You know, get it a name, give it a look and feel, dress it up. You know, there's that part. So that's the building of the brand. Then if you're already in business, we help empower your brand. So, you know, how do we help empower your brand? How do we help it? Is it not known? Is it a quiet little brand? But you want people to get to know it, to empower it. But we do all these two things to build and empower for 80%, 90% of the businesses. You want to reach your target audience. So the big aim, and we help businesses reach their target audience. Doesn't matter how you want to communicate, what you want to say. We put our brains together. We come up with brilliant campaign ideas, brilliant uh, ideas to help you, you know, tell who you are. So I am born and I live in Uganda. I have stayed here all my life. I, I, I certainly, you know, uh, built this from scratch. But with a, with a lot of help, and today I'm seeing my family here, Solomon, Diana, Beatrice, Mary, all of you guys, thank you for supporting me and being here, and Paul as well. So yeah, um, that, that's how I built my business, really through support of friends and family and colleagues. That, that has been like my big support system that has seen me where I am today and the woman I am. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Hello? Oh. Hello? Oh, okay. <laughs> I was getting some feedback. Yes, um, and um, you know, Karen Okupura and I, um, you know, like, like Jill Goodrich, we have not met face to face. I actually discovered Ms. Okuvuru on, uh, it, was a video, it was an interview that I watched with her and the brand factory and the design hub I was doing some research on digital branding and marketing for one of my own projects. And I came across her video and I reached out to her on LinkedIn, you know, to engage in some, you know, I like to reach out to folks and, you know, just ask questions and see about building a relationship. She's one of the few that actually responded. Everybody else, I guess, is busy. But <laughs> so we, we've actually we've actually been engaged in conversation and um, doing some wonderful work there an inspiration to young women in, in Kampala, Uganda, and I really appreciate our friendship. And um, you know, thank you again, all you ladies, wonderful introductions. So we'll get right into it because I'm sure that, um, you know, the, the audience, our attendees would love to know a little bit more about what you do and, and what's going on in your respective countries. So first I would like to, I'd like to go with uh, Ms. Maxine Barnett. If you take about two to three minutes, 
Um, just tell us about, you know, what was the inspiration for your current involvement in the entrepreneurship space and the current work you're doing? What was your, what, what inspired you to actually start this soft skills business? As I said in the introduction, uh, I, I was in corporate and I, I thought I would have spent my entire life in corporate. But the one thing I knew, I knew I was not going to stay right up to retirement. I knew that for sure. So I knew in the back of my head, I was thinking, okay, so when I leave this, what am I going to be doing? And that's when I saw how, 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 and that's when I saw the need, the need to step out and help leaders really hone their skills. Because sometimes people are thrown into leadership. They didn't, pre they weren't prepared for leadership. Sometimes they just wind up in leadership. And I saw all the faux pas that was being made. I also saw that uh, in the, in the sphere of business, you know, we used to think that um, uh, protocol and, 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 and those kinds of soft skills belong to the diplomatic arena. But we saw that once we started doing business across borders, there was a need for that also. So I, I literally saw the need. I saw it right around me. I equipped myself to, you know, to be able to provide it. I guess I tested the waters by providing the soft skills training inside of the corporations I was in because I became, I certified myself, I became a certified trainer, I became a certified consultant, all those things I did while inside of there so that when it was time to literally jump off, as they say, jump, you know, throw, throw your hat in the ring sort of thing, I, 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 I did. And it, it, it happened almost organically because I saw how people were inviting me, the, 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 the need, the need for that kind of help, I saw people inviting me to come and help us do this, come and show my team how to do this. So that I thought that, okay, when I jump off and get into this, get into the, the fray, there would be a need. And I'll talk a little further about that, about how, you know, some of the, some of the, the, the mistakes I made as I jumped off. I'll talk about that a little later on, but certainly the need was there. There was a vacuum and I filled it. And it's great because many of us work in corporate. We realize that we have, you know, these tremendous assets that sometimes, you know, get marginalized in corporate because, you know, we're, we're, we're there to do what the, the corporate environment and the structure enable us to do or will allow us to do. But we have this innate passion and desire to exercise our entrepreneurial goals and vision and dreams to get out there and create our own businesses. So that's phenomenal that you recognize that, that talent that you have for teaching soft skills uh, development to young people. And for Sam and Forna King, who lived in the U.S. for quite some time, you know, had that vision of returning back to her native country of Sierra Leone to start her own business, employ local Sierra Leoneans, creating jobs for the local economy there. So what was your inspiration? What was your what drove you back? There you go. I'm sorry. I have to get used to this mute and unmute, but I'm so sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> I need someone to keep nudging me. Unmute. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, so in 2011, I had actually come to Sierra Leone when we were um, celebrating our 50th um, anniversary of being independent. <clears throat> Um, I was fortunate enough to be one of the MCs for all the events from being a parliament, state house, big stadium. And um, while there, I had to interact with a lot of people and in, you know, welcoming all the dignitaries to Sierra Leone, I, I just realized something is missing. And, you know, being in the U.S. and, you know, <laughs> understanding how customer service is, is, is very, very important. I, I, you know, I looked at an ethics and integrity and all of that. And I said, you know what? Hmm. You know, I had been with the company that I was working with for a long time. So I had six weeks of vacation every year. And so 2011, I went ahead and established my company, CJ Group Limited. And then, then I started talking to companies. So every year out of my six weeks of vacation, I'll come to Sierra Leone twice, two weeks at a time, 
And then two weeks, I'll take my children on a vacation um, somewhere, wherever they decide to go. So that's how I started. And then in 2015, 2014, I lost my mother. And um, the day after they called me and said I had lost my mother, I had a call and said, can you interview with us for, for a position? So I'm like, oh my God, maybe this is the time for me to move back. But anyway, I came for the funeral. And after the funeral, I interviewed um, with this company. And then um, I had to go back because I had to go to work. I just took a, few, a week or two weeks off. And, um, and then I went back to the US. My, my older daughter had graduated. My middle child was graduating that May. So, you know, it, it, it kind of looked exciting. It looked like this may happen. You know, my kids are growing up. I had just a baby. And I said, well, you know, if, the, if, if I get offered that job, I will come to Sierra Leone. Because, you know, you can, after being somewhere for 30 years, it's, it's good to know that you have, a, you, you know, you have cushion. So that job was what, you know, was the leap of faith for me. It, it was what brought me to Sierra Leone. So they offered me the job and obviously I accepted. And I was only there for a year. And understanding the dynamics and everything that played, you know, the, 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 the environment is so, so, so male dominated. And it, it was actually one of the reasons why um, I decided to just leave that job and continue um, with my consultancy in soft skills training, where I felt like I was making a difference. Because, you know, people saw me on the streets and at restaurants and they thanked me because of the knowledge that I had um, built in them. So every time that happened, I felt good. I felt like, wow, um, this is a testimony for me to be here in Sierra Leone. And, you know, with my children, um, you know, giving me the okay to come to Sierra Leone and they really did not make life hard for me. They were very accommodating. They were not complaining. So it made it easier for me to start now calling Sierra Leone home again. And um, so I, I, I did that for a few years and because of the terrible, terrible customer um, service um, support that we have here in Sierra Leone, I um, decided that, you know, be, you know, because training is not consistent, you know, it's a consultancy, you get called maybe once a month, maybe three times a year. So it really was not consistent. I started thinking about what else can I do on a month to month basis where I can now hire um, people to work with me and be able to close in some of that unemployment gap because it's huge. It's huge in, in, in Sierra Leone. Uh -huh. And I was thinking about how can I help improve the customer service situation here in Sierra Leone? And I slept one night, woke up, and I had this idea, um, call center. When I went to the U.S., one of my early jobs in the US was working at a call center. Um, at that time it was Nextel and we were answering, um, I think it was 119, I can't even remember the, 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 the toll free number again. But I spent about two, two years of my life there at the call center and I know the impact that it made. So I decided with no help from, from anyone, no resources, um, the money that I got from training I took that money and started buying equipment, renting space, and um, started the call center, outsource call center. Um, there are call centers in Sierra Leone, but they're actually owned by the companies themselves, like telecom and, and the banks. So they have in-house call centers. What I'm offering is different. It is uh, uh, outsource, so we answer for different types of companies. And that the, the, the space worked well because of my history of training. Um, it helped me now to bring in young college graduates, um, train them, and then hire them to work in the call center. So now they are um, getting work experience. They're working. And they, they are, and, and also building up professionalism. So when they do decide to leave here, 
they go into the corporate world, they're actually four or five notches above the ones that are just coming out of um, college. The, 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 it, it's, it, it's a bit challenging here in Sierra Leone because people are not used to outsourcing jobs. Jobs are few, people are many. So everybody wants to hold on to their jobs. Whether they're effective on it or not, they just want to hold on to it. So talking to companies and convincing them that, why don't you focus on your core business and let someone else now handle your customer situation, right? So it, 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 it's something like doing it or getting it done. You know, they know it's a need, it needs to be done, but do they have time to do it? Are they being right. professional when they do this? Right. And, and, and so with that, um, as I pitch, I'm able to now, um, you know, I'm still bringing in um, um, customers. Today we have three um, customers and they're big customers, so we're very happy. And I am hiring new people. So that, you know, as, as, as a woman in Sierra Leone doing that kind of business, um, I, I feel very proud of myself because there's so many barriers um, here in Sierra Leone. Exactly. And, and, and it's great what you're doing there because you're training, you're hiring and training. You don't want to release them into corporate. You want to keep them at Sijikar. You don't want to release them into corporate. You want to keep them uh, with <laughs> Because you want, to grow, you want to grow with those employees. You want... <laughs> no, 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 no. I'd love to keep everyone. But, you know, people have to grow and people have to venture out. Because right. when I start, yeah, when, when I started um, at Nextel those years, I was only at that position for maybe two years and I did my, I did very well. So I was able to grow with that organization. So this being just, just a call center, um, right. we continuously train and hire and, you know, after two or three years, they've gotten what they need. You know, I say, this is the ingredient that they right. need to help them move forward. Right. So Thanks. yes, Austin, I'd love to keep a few. But not everyone, because we need to give room to other people to grow. <laughs> That's right. Thank you so much. And Ms. Jill, because you're you're running, you you founded and you're running a chamber of commerce where you're providing programs and services to enable women entrepreneurs to be successful, right? You woke up one morning and, and I'm sure you probably said, eh, I would love to start a chamber. Is that how it happened? No, 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 Austin, no, not at all. <laughs> you just kind of gradually eased into it. <laughs> um, I would say that my life experiences prepared me for this. Mm. It, I don't believe in coincidence. It's not a chance. Um, I actually started out very young as an entrepreneur. Mm. Uh, growing up in Michigan, um, my passion was horses. So I was an editor and publisher of my own horse magazine uh, in kindergarten. Uh, I would take these uh, mag magazines to school and sell them to my, uh, to my co uh, um, classmates. And uh, everything from there, it was always something entrepreneurial. When I moved to Atlanta in 1997 or 98, I believe it was, um, I did uh, go to work corporate, um, but entrepreneurship was always my passion. Mm -hmm. And in 2002, it was after 9-11, um, I was not happy uh, working as a woman in finance and constantly being uh, belittled. Um, so I decided it was time to do my own thing. So I was inspired uh, by the acts of 9-11 to acquire a business doing employment screening and background checks. So I hear from others, uh, there's a lot of background in HR. Um, so I would outsource my services to companies when they were hiring. Um, and then during the crisis, the housing crisis, uh, that's when I moved abroad uh, to the Netherlands. And when I returned in 2013, um, the decision was made because of parents. Um, we had some aging parents who were requiring surgeries and needed help. So the decision was made for them. 
but out of the blue, it was actually my mother uh, was stage, she was diagnosed with stage four uterine cancer and only given a few months to live. So at that point I had to drop everything to be her caregiver. And uh, I'm also hearing that similar story uh, from others. I think it was out of that adversity that led me down this path. As an entrepreneur, I wasn't doing enough to give back to the community and I wanted to share my experiences and my passions with others. Uh, there are so many resources out there now um, that weren't there uh, when I needed them. And mm -hmm. having a support system, uh, oftentimes we work in silos. We are so focused on our businesses that the business is working us. We're not working our business. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes just having a support system and making sure that you're doing self-care. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, um, you know, like I said, it's one thing led to another that led me down this path. And it was actually a meeting with a gentleman. He, he actually told me word for word, you should start a women's chamber of commerce. And it was a one-time meeting. I never saw him again until just last week. He did show up at the International Women's Day event. Um, but he planted that seed, so he served his purpose. And I took that and I ran with it. Right, right. Well, that's great. And, and again, starting from the corporate field, and but always having that, that desire to be an entrepreneur, be, be to create something for people, you know, um, and that's wonderful because yes, it, it, as as a demographic, women do need a chamber or an organization that focuses on developing them and and ensuring that when they do start businesses, they have the right programs and access to resources to ensure their success as well. So thank you so much for that and what you do, Karen Okuvuru. Karen Okuvuru, you are responsible for making businesses look great, putting them on, on social platforms and promoting their brands. Was that your inspiration as a creator? Um, yeah, that was partly it, uh, but really my, uh, it's I think the passion. First of all, I'm a passionate marketer. I. I can wake up, I breathe and sleep, you know, uh, marketing and branding. So one of the reasons I see, I feel like I keep telling people, if you can't make sales, then you, your business is as good as closed. So I feel like uh, the services we offer are very important for any business. Um, of course, that very much, you know, encourage, encourage me to start. But also to do what I love, to do what um, what I feel I was created to do. Uh, I, so that's that's that was the biggest push for me. But you know, as I, I've kept being in business, but also, you know, being a businesswoman for me as a lady gives me the opportunity to empower and give other women a chance and an opportunity to do things. But also being a mother, I look at this as an example for my young, I have a nine year old girl to tell her that you can do anything you want and you can be what you want. It's an example for her that you, you don't, nothing has to stop you. And when my daughter was about uh, recently during the COVID time, she said, I used to bring her to work with me, uh, you know, to help her with her, you know, doing online school. That made me actually feel so happy that I started this so that I, you know, I have an opportunity to still work with my daughter. But my daughter one evening said, mommy, do you know what? I want to be like you when I grow up. And I said, oh, really? Why? She said, because, you know, you were boss at home and you're boss at work. <laughs> like the whole idea. I know she now understands that she can actually be empowered. She doesn't want to be. And I, I just poked a bit and they said, oh, why do you think it's good to be a boss? She said, because everyone at my cousin's place, that the uncle, uncle so-and-so is the boss, even dad is the boss at his home, everywhere else it is the daddies and uncles, but you are the, the boss. So for, for me, I feel like, oh, finally, my daughter can see that it doesn't have to be men, that actually girls can get it, that girls can do it. 
So for me, that's like, I feel like I have done something to this nine year old girl. So that's one. And of course the, the passion, the love, the empowering other girls, the telling girls, you know, um, the women who fall, you know, because maybe of the social pressures and all the issues that come. And you tell them, oh, girls, it, it, we don't have to step down. We can actually start something and succeed at it. And here I am, I have done it and you can do it as well. So yeah, those are some of the things that have 100% wanted, made me want to do what I do. But of course the love for businesses and to see other people succeed. So yeah, that, that, that's, that's it. <laughs> Yeah. That's, so That's so important for your daughter to see what you're doing, because coming up in a society where men are always catapulted to, to the forefront of leadership and um, doing important things, it's, it's also important to know that women, too, can aspire to do um, great things, phenomenal things, can be in positions of leadership and running their own businesses. So that what your daughter sees in you is going to inspire her to one day maybe take over for the brand factory. Who knows, right? <laughs> or start yeah, her she own. can be whatever she wants. I think when we're mothers, we tell our children, you can be whatever you want. And I keep yeah. telling her, I love being a marketer. I love being an entrepreneur. So that's right. what I love. And I said, Ravina, you can be whatever you want. So exactly. for her seeing me do what I want is, is empowering. Right. right. Exactly. Exactly. The, 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 the ever busy, Dr. Matizo, the ever busy, finishing up her PhD and chief operating officer of 22 on Sloan and, and running her own business, creating her own business in Madam Waste. Um, there's a lot of inspirations, a lot that inspires you. I want to hear about that. We all want to hear about that. Well, I'm trying my level best not to be a professional busy person because eventually <laughs> it catches up with you. But on the bright side, at least I do what I absolutely love. And to answer your question, what inspires me? Growing up, I've always been interested in STEM science technology, engineering, and maths space. And the interest was to be an environmental engineer. However, life decided otherwise, but in a pleasant way. One got to a stage where, despite identifying opportunities within STEM, there was something lurking around the space of entrepreneurship. That's when I finished my master's program at the University of Cape Town, where I was looking at energy development and poverty. I came back to Johannesburg and started working with an organization called Sea Africa. Now, Sea Africa at that stage was focusing on conducting research for small businesses in South Africa with an interest to get into the African continent. I resonated with that element, especially from a STEM perspective, whereby one identified a lot of opportunities coming into the African continent, whether it's the Germans, Scandinavian, Indians coming in with their technologies, particularly from a renewable energy perspective. But where were we, the natives of the continent? What conversation, what activities, what businesses were we actually setting up within that space? And so being exposed to that element of conducting research to enable small businesses and other sectors spurred the interest into entrepreneurship. Now, how I've got to be doing all of these things in parallel is that by the time Sea Africa evolved into a much bigger organization, which is now 22 on Sloan, we had hosted, as you mentioned earlier, the Global Entrepreneurship Congress. And for the first time, it took place in Africa in March 2017. And I kid you not, it was super califragilistic, espiadidocious. <laughs> the content that we gathered was so inspiring and it led us to identifying, let's call it a legacy project in terms of the infrastructure that we wanted to have. And a key element that came out from that research was a lot of Africans you'll find are outside of the continent, right? 
men and women. What is it that's taking them out? It's the ecosystem. It's that entrepreneurial support that you would find in France, in China, in Singapore, Silicon Valley, the whole nine yards. And so establishing 22 on Stone became our response to say, before you consider relocating completely where your product is recognized as a French product or an American product, let us play within that space to give you the support that you're looking for from a access to market perspective, access to finance, the programs themselves, and just co-working space where like-minded people come through. Now, from an operational perspective, as I'm the one who ensures that the gears are well oiled to churn, the team has the resources that they need to implement, it certainly had that green side of me on the rocks, because I say to myself, that's where my passion and my interest lies. What can I do about it? And what made the ginger even bigger is seeing the number of women, particularly within that biogas and waste management sector. So the more I exposed myself to businesses within the green economy, the more I realized either you get to see a handful of women playing within the space or you don't get to see them at all. And from my experience with Madam Waste, 99% of the time it's engaging a lot of men. And one has to think, do, behave within that, I suppose, mind frame so as to get some work done. And so the interest became bigger to ensure that Madam Waste, hence the name as well, Madam Waste can be an example and a leader within the space of STEM within waste management within circular economy. So as you can see, one is drawing those experiences from working within an entrepreneurial ecosystem and environment and merging it into the green space. Earlier on today, I spoke to a young lady who's doing similar work around developing biogas technology for peri-urban areas. And I realized we ought to continue preaching the good gospel of what entrepreneurship is about and related to the green space. So those are the things that drove me into madness, <laughs> studying, running a business and being an operations officer at the same time, because they're all so intertwined and interrelated. And the vision at the end of the day, after this doctorate has now been completed, is just to continue with that element of knowledge sharing and focus on the girl child, because if she wants to be an environmental engineer and run her own thing, it is possible. It's not corporate or public sector that's going to saturate everyone and induce that innovative way of thinking. Let me stop my gospel from there. <laughs> well, thank you so much because, you know, like all of the other amazing women on this panel, what you're doing in Johannesburg, and I've, all, I've always been so inspired listening to you in our conversations and you know what you're doing before with SCA Africa, and now with 22 on Sloan, and with Jim, and with um, Madam Waste. You know, I know you've shared some of your your projects with me. You know, whatever you can you can share. But I've always been inspired and and just uh, amazed of all of the things you're doing. And you too serve as an inspiration for young girls in Johannesburg and in Zimbabwe. You know, uh, coming from you know I mean, coming from Zimbabwe as your birth country. So. It's phenomenal. It's great. Um, next, I, uh, not necessarily a panelist, but this is this is a young lady that I've known for a couple of years. Uh, met her at, at an event uh, hosted by the Jamaican Association here in Atlanta. Uh, she was running for Congress at the time, and um, you know uh, we we reconnected uh, several times, and then again at, at a past event uh this this past weekend at the Ghana Association as as they celebrated 65 years of independence um phenomenal event and um I, I just um wanted to bring her on to just introduce herself tell us a little bit about what she does and to talk a little bit about you know how women in Ghana are um being supported or not supported enough in the entrepreneurship space and um, what is the startup climate like? Because I'm going to come back to the other ladies, and we're going to talk. We're going to talk a little bit about the startup climate. Uh, Miss Elaine Amankra Nietman. She's still here. I know she had to run. I'm here. I think I muted myself. Can you see oh, me? <laughs> yeah, we see you. We see you, and we hear you. <laughs> oh, awesome. 
Okay, my name is Elena Monqua Neatman. I am an attorney here in Gwinnett County, Georgia. I am also a judicial camp, um, candidate for the county. Um, as he mentioned, my background is from Ghana, West Africa. Um, just to tell you a little bit about how it is having a business in Ghana, um, I can relate by speaking upon all of the ones I've had close encounters with. So I will just briefly just tell you about it. Um, one of the main things you have to understand as a woman is you have to be actively involved in your business. Um, you should have to be there if, if the best, I'll give an example. Let's say a woman owns a small boutique. You have to be there for the majority of time. This avoids theft. This avoids lazy employees. This avoids all types of issues. You have to be actively there. Um, only in Ghana, when you are selling clothes, you have to put clothes outside of your boutique for people to see when they're walking by. Um, the advantage of being a woman um, that sells things like clothes or things in the market is that we are great for communication and for bargaining. So a lot of people want to bargain with women versus men who tend to not really go back and forth too much and walk away. So it's a great business for women in the um, exchange field. Um, for something like a transportation business, if you own a taxi company, or a busing company, I would advise that um, you have a tracking device. Without it, a driver can tell you that, hey, they had tr car trouble all day, so they, didn't, they weren't able to drive the car all day, but meanwhile, they're using the car for business on the side, and it happens. And they're making their own private money off of your property. So make sure you have a tracking device, make sure you have a manager um, that can make sure that they're, they're putting a timer on how far the driver said they drove and how much they came back and watching the monitor, watching the speed and so forth. Um, unfortunately, if you're a woman, you have, to, you, you have to come off as stern. You have to be a little bit mean. Um, unfortunately, you can't be a smiley person. You have to come off as no nonsense because if not, you can be taken advantage of. A man is often more respected than a woman in this aspect. That's why, um, unfortunately, you have to come off as stern and mean because if you're laughing and you're being cool with your employees too much, you can be viewed as weak and they will take advantage of you. Um, you have to lead by example. Be early, be on time, and be consistent. Also have a sign-in and a sign-out timekeeping for your employees. You have to be on your game about that. Um, for... Um, other than transportation business for a major contract business or let's say even a government appointment, um, I would advise that dress code is very important. In Ghana, women have to either wear, well, you don't have to, but if you want to appear appropriate in the eyes of others, most women wear skirts and they wear dresses. So if you have a skirt suit, that's good. A dress is good. Pants are frowned upon. Shorts are definitely a no. So make sure you have the appropriate look to you. Um, there is a lot of chiefs in Ghana, different parts of the country. So you have to be respectful when you ever, you have an encounter with the chief. And um, a lot of major projects that you do for the government is gonna involve you having to meet with a chief because it's on their property. So when you meet with a chief, your tone of voice has to be less than his. It can't be higher than his. You have to make sure you curtsy when you greet him, show him respect. You can't just say, hello, hi. No, that's not allowed. That's like an American kind of thing. So you have to be able to curtsy, show respect, be humble when you speak to him, watch your tone. Um, if there's a group of people in the room, a group of men or whoever is in the room, you have to greet every single one with respect. You can't just walk in the room and greet one person and then walk away. Everybody has to be greeted with respect. And um, if there's an interpreter, you have to speak slow so your interpretation is done correctly and it's not done the wrong way. So that's just a, a brief synopsis of what it's like to um, be an entrepreneur in Ghana. And hopefully that, that um, feel free to give some questions if you have it. Yeah, and thank you because um, and we're seeing, now we're hearing that you know, the differences in culture in Ghana um, when approaching men is almost like in a subservient manner where you have to curtsy and show respect, manage the tone of your voice so that you don't come off as, you know, authoritative or, you know, over the man, you know, in, in that society. So, so you, we see, we're looking at the, the ways in which um, uh, women struggle with equality, right, in various countries. Um, not just, you know, in, in, in developing countries, but even here in the United States, where women still struggle to be on even par 
with their male counterparts, right? So, uh, so thank you uh, for that, and I appreciate that. Um, when I when I um, have an opportunity to visit Ghana, um, I will definitely consult with you as well as with the others at the Ghana Association. You know, so thanks again. Um, I just want I want to throw out the the same the same question about the startup culture, the startup climate. Um, women starting businesses in Trinidad and Tobago. How easy is it for a woman to start a business um, and to have access to all the resources to ensure a successful startup in Trinidad and Tobago? So, and, and, and when I speak about Trinidad and Tobago, I may even extend it to the Caribbean for, for mm -hmm. that kind of response because we've seen it similar. The opportunities are there to start a business. So you can start a business and many women just start a business. But the thing is to access all the, the assistance, especially financial assistance to start the business. Uh, the, the business needs to be structured. Your, financial, your financials need to tell a story. You need to have a marketing plan. And those things we see have become hindrances for some of the women who started their businesses because they are so busy just trying to get to sell the product or to provide the service a lot of times they don't have that house in order. So they are literally shut out in a sense of mm -hmm. some of the, the, the monies and startup monies that are available to start a business. The other thing in terms of the startup climate, there are uh, training programs for technical skills available, but the, the soft skills that are needed to then network and navigate and that kind of thing, those things aren't there. And what's interesting is that a lot of the women-led businesses are led by women who are the, the woman leads in their homes. So they are preoccupied with managing the home, taking care of the children. They don't have the time to get out there and network and so on. And a lot of times the men have that time to do that. So they can access, they can build relationships and access, um, you know, they have access to monies and information that some of the women don't have. So a lot of times when we, we refer to the term as SMEs, um, We've literally divided the SMEs into like four categories. You have the survivalists, you have the micro, you have the small business, and then the medium. But what we find is a lot of women are still at the survivalist level because funding is the big problem at startup. Fund is, 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 is it funding or just the fact that you are a woman attempting to, to play in a man's space. That, but, so that, that, that is it in a sense, because mm -hmm. if you can't get out there and network and do the things that are mm -hmm. needed in mm -hmm. terms of, of, of navigating in a business world, um, mm -hmm. then it becomes a, a, a man-woman issue also. But mm -hmm. it is under the ambit of access to funding. So even globally, it is said, research shows that 1% or oh, only 1% of angel funders and venture capitalists, only 1% mm -hmm. of that money is available to women, but 7% mm -hmm. available to men. So mm -hmm. it, is, it is a male-female issue, but it's mm -hmm. all under the ambit of funding and access. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I see some questions popping up, but we'll, we'll save that for the Q&A part of it. Um, Ms. Jill Goodrich, I know, I know as uh, founder and CEO, of the Women's Chamber in Georgia, I know you work with women entrepreneurs to overcome those barriers, right? To, to, to seeking the seed money and the resources that are needed to start their businesses. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, unfortunately, the situation is very similar here as well, um, where less than 2% of venture capital goes to women. In mm -hmm. fact, um, I believe it was not until 1985 or somewhere around uh, that time frame, uh, women could not even legally get a business loan without their husbands uh, co-signing. Um, but going back to the venture capital, um, as long as women are not part of the decision makers, um, we need representation, we need allies. And that's why when we host events, we always encourage men uh, to be there, to be involved, because we need those allies to help us bring us to that point where there are women who are the decision makers, um, whether it be um, the venture capitalist, whether it be 
um, in a boardroom. Um, but women need representation. And uh, it's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's important. And that's why, you know, because we have we have, you know, here in Atlanta, in, in, in Atlanta, we have several chambers. We have, you know, the East Side Chamber. We have the Metro Atlanta, the Gwinnett Chamber, you know, um, the Cab County Chamber, so on and so forth. But it's great that we have a women's chamber, as with uh, many demographics have their own chamber, you know, the Metro Atlanta Black Chamber, right. the LGBTQ Chamber, you know, of Georgia. Hispanic Chamber, Latin America Chamber, you know, so it's great that these these groups have an organization working in their favor to ensuring that they can over, overcome those barriers, you know, to, 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 to getting their, their businesses started up. Yeah, I mean, the needle is moving. It's just, it's moving very slowly. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's something that we need to to work on yeah and, and and somehow women are starting businesses at a higher rate than men from what i read but somehow yeah starting business but yet still that failure rate is high because they're not getting the access to the resources they need and and i can tell you exactly what i see and what happens is during this great resignation um the first female recession um a lot of these women were forced to make difficult decisions, whether they were in the restaurant industry or hospitality. Some of those jobs are not coming back. And then you have women who were uh, forced to stay at home um, as caregivers, either for elderly parents or for their children. They're homeschooling. They're juggling more than ever. And you're seeing a lot of burnout. And these women who are starting up their own businesses, a lot of times are self-funded. Can you hear me? Okay, I want to make sure I My screen is up at the time. So a lot of times these women are self-funding. They may be maxing out their credit cards or they may hmm. be taking out a personal line of credit uh, on their home loans or mm -hmm. even cashing out social security uh, with their huge penalties. Um, um. You know, sometimes we do what we have to do, but yeah, we need those resources. And uh, right now, um, I would say with COVID, there are some opportunities that have opened up um, that may help to level the playing field a little bit. Um, the PPP and the IDLE loans. I, I picked up the phone and I just started calling all of our members. And this is another barrier that we need to overcome is a lot, of, a lot of times women, we think that we're not worthy or if we don't check off every box, we think that we don't qualify. And so I picked up the phone and just started calling all of our members saying, you need to apply for these grants and loans. And they weren't going to, and then they did. And then they got the some of the funding and they were so grateful. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why we need that support system to nudge each other and to help each yeah. other. And yeah. um now there's a resurgence grant. Uh, you can get up to $40,000 if you uh, took any losses during COVID um, and your business is registered in the city of Atlanta. It could be uh, extra money that you had to pay out for uh, hand sanitizers, masks, anything to continue your business uh, to function during COVID. Um, and these are grants that do not have to be paid back. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, it's just getting out there and advocating and letting people know what resources are available. Um, yeah, yeah, and and, and 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 those help when when we talk about minimizing or reducing um, gender inequality is making sure that we have pathways to resources, right? Building um, uh, these collaborations and the support systems and helping our women achieve and become successful business, not just to own a business and skate by on the red or trying to get into the black, but, you know, or, or, or let's say taking your business from just a side hustle to a legitimate business, but making sure that they have the support and the resources they need in order to take them to that next level. And yes, Dr. Austin, Dr. Tizzo, yes, ma'am. Austin, if I may, just, just to, to tag on, mm -hmm. uh, and even the help 
to, to access certainly in Trinidad and Tobago and some of the Caribbean islands, even to access the funding, there's some things that need to be in place. So even the mm -hmm. help to, to get the things in place, make sure the business is registered because some people, some entrepreneurs, the business is registered. Mm -hmm. If it's not a registered business, you can't access. Put mm -hmm. the accounts in order so that, you know, you can fill in the form properly and submit this stuff. Help is needed for that too. To mm -hmm. be able to even access the, the, the funding or the help or the, the, the grant exactly. that may be available. And exactly. that puts some of the, the small business entrepreneurs at a disadvantage. Right. The re re registration, access mm -hmm. to the government mm -hmm. contracts and, sure. con you sure. know, th these, these resources. And Dr. Matizo, um, I know operating the um, 22 on Sloan and what you did prior with SCA Africa, um, what is the startup climate in Johannesburg or in South Africa as a whole? Uh, how do women navigate the, the startup uh, cycle, the startup phase of the, of the business life cycle? There's so many similarities, irrespective of where one is coming from. Uh, every point which ladies have mentioned this evening is literally what was also happening here. And uh -huh. I must say that there's a sense of hope when it comes to what small business can offer. However, the practicality of implementing that hope is where the fun challenges begin. So from a school perspective, some schools have already started updating their curriculums. However, it varies depending on A-level school, C-level school, how much money one is paid. Because when you start incorporating elements of small business development and entrepreneurship as early as primary school, at least you're looking at a generation that can welcome those ideas. And that generation includes a comfortable representation of young girls Mm -hmm. as well as their male counterparts. But the current generation we have at the moment are equally riddled by social cultural elements of childbearing. And we find in our programs, as an example, where there's the incubation accelerator, majority of the applications are men, right? The ladies who apply are able to come through, however they have terms and conditions, which entail I have to go pick up the child, I have to go ensure that the household is ready and I have to ensure that my parents are well taken care of. So irrespective of being married, single, divorced, whatever the case, there's always that component of female is a nurturer and so that environment yeah. needs to be created. The recent cases, especially around COVID, around the gender-based violence has not been assisting at all, right? Because there have been more and more light shed across the fact that women ought to be exposed, women ought to be talking about these elements of economic development, whether you're taking it from an entrepreneurial perspective or you decide to work for a small business. When you find yourself in a situation of pain and abuse, you can at least get out knowing that there is some sort of income. You're not staying in the household because you don't know where you'll go, what you can actually do in order to take care of yourself and your children. So the conversations are happening. There are small groups of women coming together, ensuring that as a give back to the community, they will move around to different peri-urban areas and just educate women about emancipating themselves economically. And from a ecosystem perspective, you also find that there are quite a few women who are I suppose let's keep, let's keep using the word nurturing small business development as program officers, as directors, and whatnot. Uh, not as much within the entrepreneurial space, but those who do have that exposure just to know what entrepreneurial ecosystems are there, we can certainly tell a difference. A few cases where we've also seen women flourish is when they co create, when they're able to work together appreciating their differences. Say, right, I might be a specialist in waste management. You're a specialist in communications and marketing, right? We can actually do something great where we're still able to fulfill whatever other duties that we need to without compromising the quality of work. And networking becomes a critical element as one says, your network is indeed your network. Mm -hmm. So the ecosystem, it is a buzz, 
from a conversation perspective, it's the implementation that brings along a bag of challenges. We do have an entire ministry that's dedicated to small business development. And I suppose like any other public sector, protocol, protocol, and more protocol. Yeah, it is yeah. much slower when it comes to implementing things right there and then. And the last point is, from a 22 and Sloan perspective, one of the most critical things that we endeavor to do is to ensure that we disseminate information through our ecosystem. So we host a variety of what we call startup paddles, masterclasses, business clinics, and are very flexible to accommodate women, more so those who may be working full-time jobs and are not able to attend during the course of the day. I guess that's one of the bright lights from a technology perspective that has enabled people to connect from anywhere, could be in the car, driving home, earphones and listening into a Zoom call, or at work, waiting for traffic to die down. So mm -hmm. we are intentionally ensuring that whatever information and programs you do, we touch base with our sister organizations who've got women-led programs and say, let us disseminate as much and as far as possible. Oh, a last point which I should just highlight is the current ecosystem, let me now speak from an African perspective, there's a lot of money coming in when we talk about venture capitalists, right? And it's looking into your fintech, edutech, health tech, and so forth. Majority of the time, these companies are owned and run by our male counterparts. But you will find that certainly there is female representation in some form of executive position or managerial position. Whether it's the female leading, that's where the great debate will lie. And that may also be induced by the fact that the entrepreneurial journey itself, it does take a lot from you. So once again, those elements of nurturing are taking the female out of fully experiencing that entrepreneurial journey. All right. Thank you so much. And, you know, um, just encouraging women from elementary school, you know, from as early as young. Is, is quite very important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have programs and I've seen programs now where they're teaching um, uh, financial wealth and, and entrepreneurship to young women in the schools here. And, and that will help too, you know, when, when we're talking about breaking down uh, gender, gender inequality and, and, and bringing women on par with men in terms of recognizing them for you know, their talents and, and their capabilities, you know. So thank you so much for that. Ms. Karen Ukavuru, um, I know in your space, digital branding and marketing, you know, I, I always say you can have all the money in the world to finance your operation, seed capital for your operation, but if the market doesn't know you exist, how are they gonna do business with you, right? So um, do you find that many women in the startup space lack the funding for the appropriate amount of marketing that's needed to get that presence? Sorry, Austin, I was trying to unmute the night, just took my <laughs> video. Yeah, thank you so much. So I, I like what you started with. I keep telling people marketing and comms. First of all, marketing is trying to buy a little space in the mindset, in the mind of your prospective clients. So, you know, it's just buying a little plot, a little bit in their mind so that they remember you every time they want your product, every time they need a product, they should come to you. But I, you know, when it comes to marketing and communications, they okay, let me go to marketing, especially. Uh, some businesses are thinking, oh, I need to first do everything right, then I go to marketing. No, you actually don't need that. You need to put yourself out there. But the thing that I am always careful about is telling people, how do you put your business out there? So that's where marketing becomes a bit expensive, the way you put yourself out there. I'm of the view always that, you know, our businesses, the way we put our businesses out there is the way people perceive us. 
So if you're going to put your business on social media with, uh, let me say, say, a phone photo, like, you know, you're taking um, a photo of your product and you decide to use a phone, the, uh, the photo is not edited and you throw it out there with bad grammar and everything, your business will be viewed as that, not serious, not this. So the way you dress up ladies and you get out and you show who you are is the way you make sure you dress up your business and show it like that. But the question was funding. Do, we, do women get the funding? Uh, first of all, I feel like women, our culture in Africa has told us to be humble, to be quiet, to take the back seat. You know, it's actually seen as a virtue to be shy and to shy away from things and nod your head. So when it comes to opportunities and when opportunities are out there, we are hesitant to pick them. We're hesitant to get them because we're seeing, we don't want to be seen as aggressive. No, ladies, and I keep telling the girls, we are not aggressive, we are assertive. We are finding our space. Uh, when a woman speaks confidently and with passion, it's looked as, as being, you know, the perspective is you're being too much. You know, you need to turn down a bit. And uh, usually when I'm discussing, for me, the problem is women is traits. The things that make us women are viewed negatively. So for instance, being emotional and being, you know, speaking like being who we are because women are nurturing. You know, if you're nurturing and you're taking care of the kids and you're being a mother, you are seen a man who a man who's not doing that is looked at as ambitious, go getter and everything. Why isn't a woman who's nurturing her children and what looked as strong, empowered, and that's what she likes. She wants to take care of her children, and that's nothing weak about that. Why is a woman who's emotional and speaking with passion? viewed as too much? Why isn't she viewed as passionate? Because a man who talks with authority and says, sit down, is looked at as being you know, assertive and doing his position and standing his ground. If I used exactly the same tone and pointed the finger, I would be looked at as bitchy. You know, working with women is so hard. Women are so bitchy. No, we are not. We are taking up our space. And we're getting what we are supposed to get. So I will talk about that even when it comes to funding. It's not like no one will put a requirement and say, women shouldn't apply. But society has not told us that it's okay for us to go get. It's okay for us to sit on the table. It's okay for us to apply for these loans. And it's okay, lady, to fail, to fail to get this loan or this funding. It is absolutely okay, try again. We, our failure is made to look as, as, oh my God, I was told to stay, you know, when you fail, you feel like, I was told to stay in a corner and I came out and I failed. Because we've been told to stay in a quiet place in the kitchen. And now we're coming out and sitting on the table and we're throwing food on the, on the dress, on the, on the floor. So. So for me, it's, it's what I feel like, even when we have the same opportunities, society has sort of made us look away. And I think for me as a business, as women who are empowered, and there's a lady here called Diana, uh, she's called Diana Chibuka, she leads a networking organization in Uganda. This lady has continuously told me, Karen, do not lose the focus on what you want. Do not let the outside noise, do not let anyone, do not lose your focus on what the goal is. So if I want funding, the questions I will ask myself, is this what I want? Yes. How do I get it? These are the requirements. And, and again and again, I say, I will have to try again and again because that's what my goal is. So if we have more women like Diana, more women who say it is okay for you to sit on the table and it's okay for you to mess up, it is not just you. The men fail as well and they fail so much and keep picking themselves up, but no one amplifies their mistakes the way they amplify ours. So I, I, for me, my, my take from, and your question was very simple, is the funding limited to us? No, no one is going to write a requirement. Do not get funding, women. 
No, it's us telling fellow women is, is saying, and saying, no, you're not being assertive girl. You're not being um, violent or anything. You're just being assertive. You're taking up your place. And the kitchen is not your place. The table is your place as well. So you can cook and still eat on the table as well. So it's what I want as women to keep encouraging each other. And like I said, Diana has continuously told me, I'm proud of you. You go get out, go get it, and you'll find the way you are. So yeah, that, that's, that's what I think for me, we, we should keep talking about, yeah. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, and um, you know, seeing the similar challenges, regardless of where we are geographically, um, women are challenged by these, you know, these barriers. Um, and, you know, again, collaboratively be assertive, know what you want, and, and just go after those opportunities and don't allow the system to marginalize you because you are a woman, right? And Ms. Samaforna King, I know it wasn't easy um, returning from the U.S. to Sierra Leone. Um, oftentimes, those of us like myself, I'm originally from Guyana, South America, the Corporate Republic of Guyana, and I know what it's like to try to go back to, you know, your country of birth and to be looked at or to be considered an outsider, right? Um, and for you, um, even more so uh, a, a, an outsider and a female, a woman, right? The startup um, environment, what was that? Did, did it affect you anyway? I mean, you started your business, yes, but how long um, did it take you to really get your business off the ground? And are women in Sierra Leone experiencing those challenges also? Thanks for that question, um, Austin. The challenges are the same. Uh -huh. I hear, um, you know, I hear everyone talking and I'm just shaking my head. I'm just shaking uh -huh. my head because, yeah. you know, access to finance is definitely one, education, um, two, entrepreneurial skills for some ladies. Um, it's definitely that. For me, when I moved um, to Sierra Leone, I actually worked from home for about, three or four years, because I was um, facilitating soft skills training, um, I did not really need an office per se, because my um, trainings were actually conducted at my, um, uh, at, at my client's um, office building, or they will, um, will have it at a hotel or an event, um, an event lo um, location. But the challenges are definitely the same. It was only about three years ago um, that I actually started renting. So the first space that I rented was, you know, a small office and, a, you know, it was very small, very, very small. And at that time, it was just the, it was just the, um, it was just the training and the room could not hold more than 20 people. So if I had to train a company that had 100 employees, we had to do it five times, you know. So, so that itself, of itself was very challenging. I, I did not um, go for financing to any banks, um, but I know talking to other entrepreneurs um, that, you know, that is, that is a big issue. In fact, it's so funny. I was at a women's conference yesterday and we were talking about access to finance and how they get it or how they don't get it. And one of the presenters, you know, she was like, you know what, even when you go for access to finance as a woman, um, before you get the finance, there's usually some other things, you know, as, as long as you're going to men for, for, for the, you know. So some of those things exist before you get a loan. There's certain other things that you'll have to do because you're, you, you know, because you're a woman. So um, that is all. And, and also, I think it's the, um, it's the education. Sometimes when women start business, it, you know, like, like Maxine said, it's survival mode. It's, you know, you're not thinking about saving. You're thinking about how do I get money today for today? So you're not putting money away to help you grow, right? Um, and, and also you ask the question about branding. Even me, as you know, I feel like I'm in a better place that I started now. I have not even invested um, the money 
for me to 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 brand the especially the call center, which is a fairly new concept here in Sierra Leone. I would love to you know have my sign and everything everywhere. It comes with a price. And because I am, you know, kind of small, trying to grow, I do a little bit at a time. I've actually done some TV commercial, have some jingles out there, have audio on my callback on my phone. But, you know, that is just me because I have some level of exposure, education and experience. So for the for the for the for the for the for the, for the women here in Sierra Leone that have not gone anywhere and they're looking for help. So in as in as in as much as they they want to do business, even if they get microfinance loans, how do they handle it? They need the education to, mm -hmm. to, to help them. They need entrepreneurial skills to help them grow, um, to help them grow their business. But the challenge is definitely everywhere. You know, as I hear, as I listen to everyone, I'm like, wow, this is unique. The, even in the US, the challenges yeah. are still there. So, yeah. so, you know, there's so much, there's so much to do um, in the woman empowerment space, so much to do. And, you know, I, I have this, this network of women and from time to time we get together and we talk about, you know, this is where we are now. How do we help the young ones? So it's not just about us. It's about mm -hmm. the ones that are coming up. How do we help them so that when they are getting, you know, when they, and I'm talking about young girls in, in, in junior high and in mm -hmm. high school, how do we now get them to be mentors and kind of help them in that space so that when they graduate from college, they, they're more focused, they know what to do. Right, right. And, and this, is, this is such a great conversation. I want you ladies to exchange contact information. I know Miss Maxine and Miss Salmon have been communicating for a while because I introduced them. Uh, I want you ladies because you know, your, your experiences are similar, right? Your experiences are similar. Um, and the challenges you're experiencing, it's ubiquitous. It permeates every corner of society. Women are just not looked upon equally when it comes to access to resources, access to capital, and being treated as equals in the entrepreneurship space, right? So it, it'll be great for you all to, to ask each other questions. Hey, I'm, I'm encountering this experience um, have you uh, encountered this experience and, and how did you handle it? What's going on there in Uganda? What's going on there in South Africa? What's going on there in Sierra Leone? You know, um, maybe I can get some nuggets then I can take back, you know, and see if I can correct a situation because this is great. We got about, we got about a half hour left in this conversation. Oh my, <laughs> this is wonderful. All right. So I want to open it up now. Um, to questions from our attendees, because I want to make sure we get questions from our attendees, right? Because I, I feel like we can go for about another hour, but I know everybody's got things to do. But this is, this, I'll tell you, I'm really enjoying this conversation. So I want to open it up now to anyone who has a question from one of our panelists. Um, please ask your question, unmute your mic, ask your questions. I know Catherine Hardwick has been firing off uh, uh, in, in our chat, <laughs> she's a she's a good friend of mine. A good friend of mine. We pick on each other. Um, she's doing some phenomenal things as well in the non in the nonprofit space. Um, so, Miss Catherine, do you have any questions for our panelists? Yes, I absolutely do. Thank you, ladies, so very much. I am really thoroughly enjoying all of this great information that you have um, shared with us today. And actually, I am a small business owner. Um, I own a, a, a company called Journey Within. It's a health and wellness uh, company. And I'm, I'm too from Michigan, relocated to Atlanta several years ago, ran for city council in Snellville, Georgia. And um, I, I believe in empowering our young people. And so. Did we lose Catherine? Mm. Can Catherine? you hear me? Can you hear oh, there me? There you go. There you uh -oh. go. There you uh -oh. go. <laughs> <laughs> I think the mute went on by itself. I don't know that artificial <laughs> intelligence. I don't know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but yes, I um a lot of you ladies, you hit on a lot of the topics. 
already regarding some of the barriers, um, but I definitely wanted to know, do you, and um, I'm in the and not being treated fairly and equitably. How did you guys, it did one, did you experience any sexual harassment coming into the entrepreneurial world? And two, if you did, how did you handle that? Who wants to take that? Dr. Matizo, go for it. <laughs> Mute was misbehaving. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kat, for the question. I have not been sexually harassed, but I know people who have. However, the closest I can come to relate is working in a space where one is challenged to always go the extra mile just because your biology is different from another person. As I mentioned earlier, working in the STEM space, one of the motivating factors as well as to why I did the doctorate was not only just for the business itself to have practical research, but to equally find myself in spaces where I can speak to a 50 year old Caucasian man and we can literally have an intellectual debate. It's not about one's physique anymore, one's melanin, it's literally a question of do you know or you don't know? Or if you say yes, why? If you say no, why? Because there's also an element of, I suppose, psycho mental abuse if one is not coming to the party with insights. And it's not to say that you don't have insights. It's then a case of the environment that's provided for you in terms of what you want to share and how comfortable you are to share that, how nervous you are to share that. So what has worked for me and continues to work for me is being assertive and being able to say no and give a solid reason as to why I'm saying no, to validate that, well, I'm saying no because A, B, C, D. Whether you like my reasoning or not, at least I stand steadfast in the response that I'm giving to you. In cases where there is a lot of flirtation and gentlemen want to become, I suppose, comfortable. I'll certainly raise the matter and just indicate that I'm not feeling comfortable around this matter. Or if I see a wedding band, please tell me about your wife and your children. How are they? Ah, oh, wonderful. What line of work is your wife in? Just to create that environment which is unsettling. So either or at the end of the day, it has been a matter of communicating what one is feeling, whether it's discomfort or assertion to make a point and say, nope, if I don't like it, I don't like it. If I agree with you, I agree with you. And being able to validate my answer to an extent that I'm comfortable to do that. I hope you can pull a few nuggets from that. Great, yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Because there's a lot, there's a lot that um, women go through in, in terms of sexual harassment and being in a, dom a, a male-dominated environment. If you want to pass through the door, you know, you got to pay the excise tax, you know. And in order for you to get from one side of the door to the next, you, you know, there are things that have to happen. And it's unfortunate, you know, and, and the women who feel compromised or feel pressured because they want to get on the other side of the door. You know, they sometimes have to give in to a man's demand, right? But for then there, then there are just some women. Hell no, I don't care. I don't. I, as much as I want to get to the other side of the door, I'm not giving you. I'm not giving you anything. You know, so it's unfortunate. Uh, anyone else who want to take that that uh that question to answer that yeah, question? I, hey, Tama, I, huh? Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I just laughed the word. Number one, I start calling you sir. Oh, I start saying to you, my brother, you know, everything I'll be saying, oh, my brother, you do, you can. And, and then I start telling them how difficult I am. I'm just a difficult person. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm easier when we do business. Mm -hmm. Out of business, I'm just very, very difficult. And I just try to laugh it out. And mm -hmm. eventually we become friends. Because then, you know, like, like, like Dr. Mutesa said, I bring the family in. How's your wife? How's your children? Show me pictures. You know, I have an additional interest in that now. And then as we're talking about that, I'm still reminding them of, you know, the business that's on the table that we need mm -hmm. to talk about. But I just kind of laugh it out. And I always say, sir, or my brother. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Anybody else? That's great. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a good way to diffuse that, you know, to throw them yeah. off and de-escalate any unwanted attention or approach yeah. that yeah. You, you, you don't need, right? Miss Maxine. Yes. Um, but I know, I know in the Caribbean, I know a lot of women are pressured in that so, way. And yeah. also my, my, ad, my addition to what the two ladies said before me is that we, we sometimes what we do or what I, what I have done is discourage even the very slight, the very slight, because sometimes some of the sexual harassment is very overt, but some is mm -hmm. very slight. Yes, dear. Right. So as soon as you call me dear, I let you know immediately mm -hmm. yes, for my husband. Not for anyone else. As soon as yeah, you, say, that's you, right. cut, you cut things very, very early, or some, mm -hmm. you know, someone wants to, you know, wants to pretend as if they're hugging or that kind. You cut it early because if you allow yeah. one little piece to pass, then it extends into something else. So you cut mm -hmm. it very, very, very early, and mm -hmm. so that they don't get a chance. They don't get a chance to advance at all. So, mm -hmm. and I am talking even from when I was in corporate, from when mm -hmm. I was in corporate. So I'm working on something, and you hover over me. In an yes. uncomfortable way, I, I cut it immediately. I said, I am very uncomfortable with that. I need mm -hmm. my yes. social space. So you cut it mm -hmm. very early before it gets yes. a chance, before it gets yes. a chance to advance. Um, yes. if you I literally, <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. thank you. Because I literally have to put, you know, how you have your office desk. I had to pull my drawers out to come on my side. So that's unfortunate that you have to do that in this day and age. Yes, your social so I space. see what you're saying. Yes. Sure, sure, mm -hmm. Yes. Sure, Even sure. though you say I'm not comfortable, I need for you to stay on that yes, side. They still would try to find a way like they were handing me papers. You can hand me the paper on that side. You don't have to come <laughs> on this side. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Austin, Austin, there's a, an early, early question in the I, I don't know if the person is still there, where the person wanted us, wanted to wanted us to share some of the mistakes that we may have made. Yes, so please. That, that was yes. actually it's, I, I, it was a, I would it was like to my, my, yes. it was on one of my four pages of questions. You can go right. ahead. <laughs> I would like to share on that because even when uh, Karen was speaking earlier, it reminded me too of some of the earlier mistakes that I made. So for example, because I came out of corporate, my first big mistake I made was that I felt that everybody in corporate was going to call me and, and I would have business. So I didn't feel to, because I got calls while I was in corporate, I thought that was going to continue when I stepped out. And I didn't think there was a need, Karen, for a marketing plan. I didn't think there was a need for anything. So I just thought that it would happen. That was the biggest mistake I made. So I had to retrace and say, okay, that's not how it happens. Because you have to, put, as she said, put yourself out there, market yourself. So I did not have a marketing plan. The other mistake I made was the question of understanding what we, what we sometimes refer to as feast and famine. When you are in the job, you get paid every month. When you are an entrepreneur, it does not happen that way. And how do you plan for when there's famine? How do you plan for that? And how do you take care of yourself during that period where there isn't income or, or you go through a, what, they, what they call a rough patch? So that was another mistake I made. There is feast and famine and how do we prepare for that? The other right. mistake I made was networking. <clears throat> I, you know, I, 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 did, I didn't think I needed to network. Now I understand the power of networking so much that that's one of the soft skills that I teach because, you know, networking is a, is a skill. Not everyone knows how to do that. Collaboration is a skill. You have to learn how to do those things. So those are some of the mistakes that, that you make. And one of the, the biggest mistake I made was, um, I was, I was, I got a phone call saying, Hey, we need you to do this. And that's what I was in my consultant mode at that time. We heard about you and we need you to do this. So I then planned and I sat down and I turned down other jobs at the time because I said, this is a big project and this is going to take me through the year. And then something happened where the organization, for some reason, they, had, they couldn't do it again. And I was left just out there in the open. I was devastated. I was early in my, my, my consult. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do because I had, through, I had told others I wasn't available and then this wasn't. So that we have to learn how to balance those kinds of things in the earlies. And I believe we need mentors and, and people who've done it before to help us to, help us to do that. Yeah? I, I, I want to get to uh, Colleen Bornelis. Um, if you can just show us what you look like and, and uh, ask your question. Because uh, we definitely want to get your question in. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. And I um, just want to say a wonderful um, presentations by the, the panelists. But I wanted to find out, since I'm here in the U.S., I wanted to find out what are some developing areas internationally that you guys are seeing um, that women are kind of dominating in, in maybe Africa or the Caribbean. Um, I just want to hear more about that. She must have, she must have read my questions. <laughs> <laughs> Go right ahead. Anyone? Ms. Karen? Yeah, um, in Africa, some of the areas that, you know, women are dominating in, okay, I'll speak for Uganda. Some of the areas I'm seeing uh, as women excelling in here or doing so well, one of the things is, um, you know, cosmetics. Um, the other is, you know, service-led industries. Um, in general, you know, services as providing marketing and communication services. If you went into customer care, you would do well. If you went into um, even uh, health is heavily uh, taken over by men, but I believe it's a field that women would succeed in, in my country. Um, I would talk about, of course, baking has always been a women's thing. But um, consulting, consulting in any kind of uh, anything like I was talking about, you know, advertising. Uh, ah, and another field is law, the field of law. There are lots of women in the law field in the country. And, um, and women there are more respected and uh, appreciated. I feel like there's a bit of a better playing ground for the women in law. Uh, what are the service with us? Yeah, beauty and cosmetics, and yeah, that's it for now. That's that's where. Uh, if I remember anything, I'll throw it in the chat. <laughs> ah, and Diana, you can put something in the chat. <laughs> All right, Miss Summer. Yeah. Um, so basically, some of what Karen um, has says, and and one thing I see now in in Sierra Leone, we're having fitness experts. So, you know, the country, a lot of women are getting to be very health conscious. And I see more women being fitness experts. They're, you know, they're pulling people together, um, teaching them how to eat healthy and um, having them, um, you know, the, the exercise routine. I see a lot of that. And then I see um, a lot of women getting into the fashion space where they're now using out the you know the African fabric and having um, contemporary um, outfit made. I see a lot of that going on, and also um, um, a lot of women in the entertainment space. A lot of women, um, new restaurants, new different types of restaurants. The other day, um, this lady she's now opening a Jamaican restaurant, and then I heard of a Ghanaian restaurant. So, so women are really thriving now. They're really getting to where they want to be their own employees. So I say, you know, for Africa, I think Africa is such a virgin ground. You just mm -hmm. have to have a niche come here and create your niche and just, mm -hmm. and just keep working at it. Yeah. That's great. That's great. And, and Ms. Jill, you may have um, uh, a member of your chamber who might be looking at uh, global expansion into one of the African countries or any country. And who knows, they might need some marketing and branding and soft skills training, yeah. right? They might one day have a, a, a large enough company where they need a call center to handle their calls. You see where I'm going? You know, so. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. In fact, um, I was looking at call centers uh, maybe a year ago or something. Um, so absolutely 100%. Um, yeah. For us, I think we see a lot in the service sectors, uh -huh. um, uh, business to business. Um, uh -huh. And also we're gonna do our first uh, women, uh, Earth Day Women and Sustainability Summit. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna be doing that next month because okay. we have a lot of women who are doing things um, environmentally. It could be, we've got one woman who actually um, has a protein powder made of um, insects um, and she incorporates it into uh, uh, different types of foods. So you can't actually taste it. Um, 
there are just so many things and, and a lot a lot of our ladies are doing business in Africa. Um, we've got uh, several who are doing, uh, I think somebody mentioned a uh, cloth. Um, we have women in fashion and uh, a woman who's making beads in Uganda. Uh, she brings the beads here and sells them and then, um, and then sends the money back to this village in Uganda. Uh, they're absolutely beautiful. Um, so absolutely, I, and in fact, we've got a few members who are actually moving to various parts of Africa. And so I see opportunity for expansion. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful, wonderful. Miss Maxine, you had just, something? To yes, just to add, because some of those same businesses that have been mentioned, particularly the ones that Sama mentioned, what I have found, yes, um, they are popular for the women to enter, but the virtual space has enabled it even more. Yes. You know, and has helped the women to um, offer their services like the fitness services so that you can stay anywhere and access the fitness service. You know, you can access the yoga class, you can access the, 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 the health and fitness session. Uh, they, they, they can sell their clothing online. They can, mm -hmm. so that I have, I have just wanted to add that the virtual space has helped to propel it even more. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And, 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 and definitely because we see like here, we track uh, what's called Black Friday sales, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, over the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, the Thursday, the Friday, Small Business Saturday, uh, Sunday, Cyber Monday. Monday. Every yes. year, every year we see virtual sales vir uh, um, uh, just keep increasing and increasing. And it's just letting you know yeah. that businesses are now taking their operations online. You know, the e-commerce space is growing. So yes. you can imagine being a, a coffee grower in Uganda or a coffee grower in Ghana or a coffee grower in Zimbabwe, and you are, you are selling your coffee or your beads or your merchandise online because that's, where, that's the next great thing. The path to growing revenues and, 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 and creating jobs and creating wealth is now going onto the virtual platform. So the e-commerce spaces um, is where we're seeing that uh, happening. Ms. Okufuru. Uh, just for one more area that sector that women are working in well is agriculture yes. and uh, the value chain of agriculture, like uh, from production to adding, uh, you know, value to their products. Sure. Um, yeah, that's another yeah. field that is really open. And, in, and merging technology with, with agriculture so agriculture. that there are different ways now of growing. And, fat, and yes. even faster ways of growing, yes, yes. Yes, exactly. Without chemicals, without chemicals. Ex ex exactly, exactly. <laughs> so we're, we're on seven minutes from close time. And, and again, I want to respect everyone's time because you're all valuable to us. Um, I, I want to do a, uh, um, a round table from all of our five panelists. If, um, if there's one thing inspirational that you can share with a young woman who has an interest in small owning a small business and entrepreneurship? What would that be? And if you take a minute just to answer that, what would that be, Miss Maxine? Mm, I didn't get the minute to answer it. <laughs> 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 um, can I? Can I just? Um, uh, can I? Am I a co-host? And I just throw up a slide just to, just to take that minute. Can I throw up a oh, slide? Yes, please, please, please. I'm so sorry. I forgot what we discussed. Yes, please uh, do. That. So, yes, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not seeing. I, I, I'm able to share? Yeah, you, um, hit, hit the share, hit, share screen. Okay. Um, okay. Yes, can you see? Yes. Are you, are you able to see? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So... I want to go to that this is this is this is my page for the young people and i say as what i leave with young people is that they must have a passion you must know what that passion is you must mm -hmm. have a passion if, you, if it's not passion you, you you can't move forward it mm -hmm. is important to prepare it is important to know okay what you've decided to do you prepare you do the research etc etc it's important to persist because you're going to meet roadblocks you're going to meet all kinds of <clears> things that could interfere but you get up and dust yourself and you move on. So you persist. It's important to deliver. If you say, this is what I deliver, you deliver. It's important. It's, it's not good to just have the product and you're always late or you can't deliver and so on. It's important to deliver. 
And last but not least, it's important to know your why. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And for young people in Trinidad and Tobago, there are hosts of places they could access. And yes, there's a youth business uh, of Trinidad and Tobago that they help them to accelerate their business, to start their businesses. There's the Caribbean Women in Trade, for those who don't know there's that. And then on a more international level, there's the Women Innovators Network in the Caribbean. And last but not least, there's She Trades. She Trades. Um, the business that I do to help young people is to communicate, to collaborate, and to be creative. And those are big umbrellas because under those umbrellas, they have to learn how to present themselves. They have to learn how to work with others. They have to learn how to come up with creative solutions. They have to learn how to network. Those are things that as young people, we need, you need to know as you enter, as you enter business. And I offer myself as a, as a coach for soft skill services to help you grow fearlessly. And that, those are the words. And last but not least, make sure for us when we get to that point where we have grown our businesses to be a mentor and pull another woman along. That is my mantra. Let's pull another woman along with us. Those are my That's words. That's right. Paying it forward. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And Ms. Sama, what, would you, what nuggets would you leave to a young lady um, who is interested in the entrepreneurship space and one day owning her own business and she's looking at you and all the success you're achieving, what inspirational words of encouragement would you offer to her? Oh. Your mic. Unmute. I'm still learning. <laughs> I will say to them, take the initiative to be where you want to be. Do the research. Do the research. That is important. You need to know, um, you know, where you want to go. Um, you want to be bold. Be bold. You want to be patient. You have to believe in yourself and whatever service or product that you're offering out there. You want to be humble, but not timid. Don't be timid, be bold. And also you want to look at every disappointment as a teaching moment. Mm -hmm. And then you want to learn from whatever mistakes, because you are going to make mistakes, but you want to use it as a teaching moment. And lastly, enjoy what you do. Because if you enjoy what you do, then it's not a job. You wake up every day, every morning, and you're happy to go do it. And when you do that, even when you have disappointments, you cry over it at night, you wake up in the morning and you keep going. Life is not easy. Who says it's going to be? But you just have to take the bull by the horn. And as a woman, you need to always, always try to be successful. Always. Because the odds are against us. Thank you so much. Ms. Okavuru. Yeah, the way Austin calls my name. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, so it's Miss Akuvuru. It's Akuvuru. <laughs> it's more kind and softer name. So, um, <laughs> so first of all, to the young ladies, I would say persist. You know, keep going and don't stop. Do not give up. It's like cycling. The moment you stop cycling, you're falling off. So keep cycling, keep going, keep going. Number two, like everyone has said, know your why. Why did you start? Why are you there? What are you doing? Number three, I tell everyone, self-awareness. Know who you are. Do not let anyone or anything else define you. Know your strength, know your weakness. I keep telling people, if you told me my weakness, I would be like, yeah, I know that. I know I don't know that. Know yourself so well that you know when the, when what will happen and you can even predict it and be able to go away from it or teach yourself because once you know your weakness, you can work to stop it and make it, you make it into a strength. And uh, those, those are the three, those are some of the three things that can tell everyone, be self-aware, persist, and you know, know why you are there, know your why and keep going. But one thing I want to say to all the ladies from Uganda who have stuck here, Diana, Salma, Annette. So there are two Dianas and one is my sister. Uh, Diana, thank you for being here and keeping here. And I really hope you've learned something from these ladies 
and have encouraged you. And to Diana Chibuka, thank you for encouraging other women in your capacity. And to Annette, you know, these women that I'm talking about, ladies, are, are really strong women. They're women who have stood the test of time. Like I said from the beginning, Diana Ayn has improved me when I first joined the networking organization that she leads. I had one client, one client who was paying me about $90 a month. <laughs> you know, when you're just starting out, that's four years ago. And when I joined this network, my first meeting, I left with two clients. I was like, yeah! You know, you know that excitement. <laughs> you should have seen me after that meeting. I came back to office with a lot of energy in my handbag with my heels. I'm like, I am not putting these heels off ever. So, you know, <laughs> you know, we all need these ladies. And I wanted to share that. And when she said, Karen, I shared the link and she's joined. For me, it's, you know, those ladies who give an opportunity to when you're just starting. And when, especially you're 29, you don't know what to do, you're scared. You, you're like, you don't know what you're gonna, what is gonna happen. So, yeah. So thank you all for coming. And, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Ms. Jill? Well, they've already covered uh, quite a bit. Um, maybe just to expand on a few things, I would say to be focused. Um, don't worry about what your neighbor's doing next door. Um, you do you, and uh, yes, we must be able to pivot uh, when things happen, uh, but stay focused. Uh, if you're looking in the rear view mirror or looking around, you're going to end up rear-ending someone else. Um, I would say to expand upon uh, your passion, um, find that thing that makes you wake up in the morning. Find that thing that you would do for free and find a way to monetize it. And lastly, I would say, just do it. Uh -huh. When I launched the Women's Chamber, the website was far from perfect. It looked like a fifth grader probably could have done better. Uh -huh. But I did it, and you can always fix it and upgrade it and make it better along the way. But you've got to start somewhere and just do it. Exactly. Thank you so much. And last and certainly not least, Dr. Mutizo. I was just on a work call. Apologies, I stepped aside. Let me make sure I'm on the same wavelength. These are the closing remarks. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, just want, yeah, take a minute just to, how would you, what words of encouragement would you give a young lady seeking uh, opportunities to run her own small business and, and be in the entrepreneurship space? All right. My favorite, favorite phrase, churn an entrepreneurial mindset. Be a curious individual. The time you spend on your phone, on social media, that's all right. But equally dedicate a few minutes just to read about what entrepreneurship is. What does it entail? What are the business stages? Hey, what's a venture capitalist? A business model canvas? Pricing strategies, all of these things. Be a curious young lady, be a curious woman, and equip yourself with as much information as possible. At the end of the day, no one can take away the insights that you've learned unless they literally take out your brain. You can be unemployed today, but because of the insights and the skills that you're developing, you can always wake up one morning and literally just do it like Jill said. In addition to that, capitalize on all these free online courses, whether it's looking at directly the entrepreneurship element or the sector in which you want to realize the business, be it agriculture, cosmetics, STEM, do those online courses, project management, operational management, Compliance and executive management, do it all, because at the end of the day, all of this which you're acquiring, no one can take away from you. Irrespective of how the cookie will crumble from an economic perspective, social perspective, you will always have enough tenacity to make a quick decision in terms of what entrepreneurial activity you can focus on. And a closing point, again, network is your network. Have these conversations at baby showers 
when you go out with the girls, have the conversations with the male counterparts as well, so that we can equally churn the mindsets in terms of how we see each other adding value to one another instead of demising the next person. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And with that, because we have, we were five minutes over, and again, um, in respect to everyone's time, I just want to say a huge thank you to all you ladies uh, for being on this panel and discussing um, your experiences in your respective countries. You know, South Africa, Uganda, Sierra Leone, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, and the United States of America. And I, I want to say, you know, um, we're celebrating in the month of March, we're celebrating Women's History Month, International Women's Day, but women's history is 365 days a year. And that, I think that's where we, that's part of where we need to start changing that narrative is that we don't just recognize, all of a sudden wake up and start recognizing women for their achievements just for 31 days out of, out, out of the year. But for 365 days a year, women are making history. Women are doing phenomenal things. And regardless if we live in systems that continue to marginalize women, and to promote inequalities and disenfranchisement for women, that women still continue to break those glass ceilings to do phenomenal things. You know, and um, Ms. Jill Goodrich, as she spoke earlier today, women um, must know that you do have allies in the bodies of men. You know, so you do have allies who are working on behalf to make sure that um, we are uh, uh, leveling the field out there, all right? And we heard about collaboration. We heard about uh, creating those ecosystems of success. Um, these are the things that, um, that will resonate with not just our attendees, but with anyone, because this, this will be on my, my Facebook page. This, you ladies will have the link to do whatever it is you wish to do with it to promote um, this, this panel discussion, and it will be on my YouTube channel. So, you know, we will always have access to it, you know, and thank you for all that you do, all the phenomenal work you do in your respective countries, being um, women of inspiration, being the examples for the young girls to look to, and young boys, there's nothing wrong with young boys looking okay. to a woman who is successful. As I look to you, you know, and, and draw inspiration from your stories and what you are doing. So to you ladies and to all of our attendees, Thank you so much. We, we, we are only 17 days into uh, Women's History Month, but remember, women's history is 365 days a year. Mm -hmm. Continue to be phenomenal. Continue to be successful um, in your respective journeys, and we shall, we shall keep in touch. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank, Thank you, ladies. You. Cheers. Bye. Austin, where's the champagne, right? Cheers, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>